In this Let's Visit episode, I'm going to show you what a modern, second part of the 20th century nuclear-powered submarine is like. Then I'll take you back to the second half of the 19th century, to the beginning of American submarine construction. Stay with me. This should be fun. Brighton, Connecticut is the U.S. Navy's primary East Coast submarine base. It is the home port to 15 attack submarines and covers more than 687 acres. Adjacent to the sub base is the Submarine Force Library and Museum, managed exclusively by the U.S. Navy. It is located on the Thames River in Groton, Connecticut. It has 33,000 relevant submarine artifacts both inside and outside the museum building. These circular structures show the circumference of the first subs, the inner circle, and that of today's submarine, the outer circle. <music> Lieutenant Commander Benjamin Amdur has agreed to take us on a special tour of the USS Nautilus in just a little bit. The NR-1 is a small, deep-diving, nuclear-powered submarine built by the General Dynamics Company. It is the smallest nuclear sub ever built. The SSX-1 is an experimental submarine which allowed a diesel engine to be operated underwater, independent from an external source of air. This is a World War II Japanese two-man submarine this type of sub was used on the attack at Pearl Harbor. Inside the museum, many mock-ups showing how submarines were controlled. Visitors are encouraged to sit down at the consoles to find out what it was like to drive a massive submarine. Yes, there's even a working periscope that allows you to home in on your car in the parking lot. Here are a variety of modern torpedoes. The Nautilus submarine is famous for two reasons. It was the first nuclear-powered vessel and it was the first ship to go under the Arctic ice cap and travel beneath the North Pole. Twice of June, shortly after midnight, the Nautilus slipped quietly from her berth in Seattle, presumably starting her homeward voyage south. But the course set by the Nautilus actually took her farther and farther north. Unseen, beneath the sea, the Nautilus journeyed north to the edge of the Arctic ice pack, then hunger. In the main hall of the museum, we see a 20 millimeter deck gun. Suspended from the ceiling is a 50 foot long cutaway model of the USS Gato. From the second floor, we can look right into the sub. This panorama shows the history of submarine development.
The nuclear-powered engine of the Nautilus was invented by a group of scientists at the Atomic Energy Commission. Congress authorized its construction in 1951 and its keel was laid by President Harry S. Truman in 1958. The sub was chosen to conduct Operation Sunshine, the first crossing of the North Pole by a ship. In recognition of her pioneering role in the practical use of nuclear power, the Nautilus was designated a National Historic Landmark in 1982. I'm Lieutenant Commander Benjamin Amder. I'm the officer in charge of Historic Ship Nautilus and the director of the Submarine Forest Museum. This is Historic Ship Nautilus, the world's first nuclear-powered ship. Welcome. We're at the Submarine Forest Museum, and behind me is Historic Ship Nautilus, the world's first nuclear-powered submarine. With her nuclear reactor, she changed submarine warfare forever. We start our tour in the ship's torpedo room. We are in the forwardmost portion of the ship. As you look around, you'll see a couple of torpedoes that were typical of what Nautilus carried when she was operational. The ship was in commission from 1954 through 1980, and as the first nuclear power ship, she pioneered uh, much of what modern submarine warfare is today. Uh, the ejection pump is what actually pushed the torpedoes out of the tubes using water. They didn't swim out as they, do, as they used to in the World War II days, but the torpedo was really propelled out using a, a high-pressure turbine. This is the torpedo loading hatch. This is how the torpedoes would have been brought into the torpedo room from up on deck. It would have been basically slid down using, uh, using uh, what we call a skid and, uh, and very carefully lowered into the <laughs> torpedo room, often using a crane or a davit. And don't drop them. And don't, yes. You get this side here. Yeah. So this is for the, uh, for the average sailor. This might be where you slept. Uh, Nautilus was uh, the first ship where every crewman had their own real bunk. You didn't have to uh, do it in turns, right? Not unless you had extra people on board. Then you'd do what we call hot racking, which is, uh, still continues today. If you have extra per personnel on board, either trainees or an inspection team, or maybe specialists for a mission, then you might have extra people on board. And how many guys hit their head? All of them eventually. <laughs> Okay, so we're now entering the ship's wardroom. This is where the officers ate, studied, conducted paperwork and meetings, and uh, really one of the, the two spaces on the ship where you could gather any group of people, uh, any number of people together to conduct anything. So, uh, but mainly eating, work, and meetings, training were the main things that would have been conducted in the wardroom. Pretty fancy outlay here. <laughs> Pretty typical, actually, for a, for a submarine. And not nearly as fancy as a surface ship. For sure. Uh, these, are, these are some of the officers' staterooms. So the officers lived two or three to a stateroom. And you can see that each will have uh, two or three bunks, uh, desks, and a small sink that will fold into the, that folds up. So we're now looking at the captain's stateroom. Uh, this is the, uh, he is the only person that gets his own room on the ship. Even the XO has to share his room when, uh, you, if you had any sort of uh, VIPs on board or maybe the, the squadron commodore or an admiral, they would share with the XO, but no one ever has to share the captain's stateroom. And this one? And that's the executive officer. So that, he's the number two guy on, the, on board the, the ship. Runs the day-to-day -day operations and uh, typically will go on to command himself in a, in a couple of years. So the ship is, is separated in five watertight compartments and these have these very heavy duty doors that can be shut to seal off one portion of the ship from another in the event that there was water on board flooding uh, so that if water got into one part of the ship it wouldn't fill the entire ship. So the bridge is the area on top of the sail where you would drive the ship when you were on the surface. Uh, what we're in now is the attack center. So this is the fighting heart of the ship. This is where the officers drove the ship when, 
controlled the ship when the, the ship was submerged. You see the periscopes, uh, fire control equipment, sonar is on the other side. Uh, navigation towards the back. On more modern submarines, this area has been combined with the control or with control where the ship is physically driven from. But on, on uh, this class of ship, more like a World War II boat, the attack center and control are separated. And we'll see control next. No one likes to see the periscopes. These are the ship's original periscopes. You said periscopes, so there's two. There's two, yep. Yeah. One forward, one aft. Forward one is what we call the search periscope, and the aft one is the attack periscope. The search periscope is a little bit larger, has more capability, but it's also uh, physically larger on the surface. The attack periscope is smaller, uh, so it's a little stealthier. Okay. Ship's radar. Not so now, this is the radar. This is the radar, exactly. So the radar antenna is on the top of the sail, and of course is only useful when the ship is on the surface. Right. So sonar through here, there's a, there's a door you can see through and the window, the glare is going to be tough. So this, I uh, want a shot of the, the, uh, the stairwell because it's, uh, it's actually unique. This is the first stairwell that was ever installed on a submarine. And the reason it's, she's, it's the first stairwell that uh, was ever installed on a submarine is that this was the first submarine that was big enough that actually, to actually require two levels. Uh, that you know where uh, people worked on a regular basis. Uh, she's really the largest submarine of her time. Two complete decks going forward and aft, and so that uh, enabled them to put a stairwell in. But because it was the first, and because it was so large compared to the ladders that preceded her, it's sometimes referred to as the grand staircase or the grand stairwell. Although it doesn't really look that big. But we made some of the things we take for granted <laughs> on a modern ship. So now we're in the control room. The ship was uh, fought and directed from the attack center above, but this is where the ship was physically controlled from. A total of five people would have stood watch in this space. You see uh, three, three here. The helmsman controls the rudder. The stern planesman controls the stern planes in the back of the ship. That controls the angle of the ship. And then the bow planesman controls the, uh, the, the horizontal planes in the front of the ship that uh, from the outside shots you can see are folded up right now and that would have controlled the ship's depth. Uh, behind them would have stood uh, the dive, the diving officer of the watch, which would have been either an officer or a uh, senior chief petty officer. So this is crew's mess. This is the largest open space on the ship and uh, is actually quite large even by today's attack submarine standards. Uh, there would have been additional tables down the middle where we're now walking. Uh, this is where the crew ate, it's where the crew studied, it's where meetings would have been held, briefings, They'd watch movies in, in the evening. Uh, if there was a medical emergency, this might also be where the doctor was treating people. So this is, uh, this is sort of the heart of the ship for the crew. Even the guy with the mask on. <laughs> right. Now the mask, that's an emergency air breathing mask. We call it EAB. And uh, it's a low pressure forced air system that the, uh, every crew member had a mask, and this is, this is, we're talking about the mask with the hose here. Every crew member had an EAB mask. There'd be one in their bunk and then one at their watch station as well. And in the event of a fire or some other casualty on board the submarine that affected the atmosphere, uh, you know, smoke would rapidly fill the ship and you wouldn't be able to breathe. Uh, and so this system was invented to basically give every crew member a method of, of being able to breathe in the event of a casualty and fight the fire. The ship was not built with this system. It didn't exist when the ship was built. It was actually invented by the crew on, this, on board this ship after they had a fire in the uh, late 1950s. And, and it was, this was also where religious services were held? Yep, religious services would have been held here on Sunday. There's no chaplain on board a ship this small, so it would have been a lay service that was uh, led by a volunteer from the crew. Thank you. I want to look point the camera down there. Beneath crew's mess is the ship's battery well, at least beneath this portion of the ship's mess, this, the crew. So the main source of power on board Nautilus was, of course, its uh, first of a kind nuclear reactor, but she still had a battery to provide backup power, to provide uh, in, 
a second source of power in the, in the event of an emergency. Now you did not have to surface to charge these batteries because the nuclear engine would take care of that. Correct. The ship also had two diesel engines as a backup source of power as well, but those of course required that the ship was on the surface. This is the ship's galley. This is where meals were prepared four times a day for all of the ship's crew. Officers and the enlisted crew eat the same food cooked in the same galley. Uh, the food was just brought up via a dumb waiter to the officer's mess, which is directly above. Uh, Nautilus's nuclear reactor gave her capabilities never before seen on another submarine. Uh, unlike every submarine before her, she spent the majority of her time submerged underwater. And as a result, uh, she was a much more effective warship. Additionally, uh, the nuclear reactor provided virtually unlimited amounts of electricity, which provided uh, great, uh, great advantages for the crew. Uh, the ship was completely air conditioned, and so it was very comfortable. And things like uh, an ice cream machine were possible at all times of the day, not just when you were on the surface running your diesel.